Hey y'all, what's up? Welcome to day three of 40 days through the Bible. You know, I thought this outfit was gonna be really cute until I put the mic on and I was like, girl, this is not cute with this microphone, <laughs> but it's okay. Listen, I said, I'm gonna get cute for Bible study, but let's go ahead and jump into day three. So today I'm excited because we were talking about Noah in the flood. Now, listen, if you are discovering this video and you have not seen day one and day two, then you need to go ahead and click below and go to the playlist. I'll leave a card somewhere in this video so you can go back to day one. Uh, but all these videos will be on the same playlist. So this is 40 days through the Bible with Lisa Turkers, Turkers, Every time I say her name, it's something different. But we're going to be talking about today, Genesis chapter six, Noah and the flood. OK, if you want to start here, I guess you can. But you didn't miss Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve was spicy. OK, it was spicy. The whole Bible was spicy, but it was not very demure. <laughs> so you do want to go back and read. All right. So let's go ahead and kick it off. Day three is titled Noah and the flood. I'm going to read out of the actual Bible study first, and then I'm going to go into my NIV life application Bible and we're going to read there and then we're going to discuss the questions. Okay. I will leave the link to grab this Bible study in the description box below. Okay. Noah and the flood. God flooded the world, but Noah and his family found favor with God. Today's reading comes from Genesis chapter six. And Genesis chapter six, verse eight says, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now we meet another one of God's created ones. His name is Noah. Noah's godly life stood in stark contrast to the wickedness and evil on display in the lives of the people around him. God's word tells us Noah was a righteous man, blameless, and that he walked with God. So we're going to go ahead and read Genesis chapter 6, NIV, Life Application Study Bible. And it says wickedness in the world. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with humans forever for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. So this is God saying y'all gonna live to 120 and that's it. Okay. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old men of renown. So they were on the earth in those days. Also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Verse six says the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe them from the face of the earth, the human race I have created and with them, the animals, the birds and the creatures that move along the ground for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Verse nine says, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. And he walked faithfully with God. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits high. Now, I'm going to tell y'all this. Noah is lucky, OK, because not one time has God given me instructions and said, do this, do this, do this. Like it was never this specific, but also I could see why God communicate with him in this way, because we're talking about God telling Noah that water's going to fall out of the sky. By the, by the way, at this time, rain had never happened there. No one knew what rain was. Rain was not a thing. There was no water coming out of the sky. Okay. There was just the ocean and the seas and the rivers, which we read was created in Genesis one. So all they knew was there's the ground and there's water on the ground. But now you're telling me that the water on the ground is going to be water in the sky. That's like God coming to one of us and saying grass is going to grow out of the clouds. And we're like, what? So for him to give this instructions to Noah and give him so specifically and tell him that something was going to happen that Noah could not even like put together in his head and Noah listened was amazing. But I digress. Verse 16 says, make a roof for it. So he's telling him how to make the ark. 
leaving below the roof of an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature has, that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark. You and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. So that is all of chapter six. We see God giving Noah very specific instructions. There is not, not at all in this chapter six. Do we see Noah questioning anything that God has told him? Although it sounds quite insane. He just says, uh, he doesn't say anything. It just says, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. That's all it says, right? So that's how we can say that it happened. So let's go and answer these questions. So question number one for today says, read Genesis 6, 5 and write your observations about the thoughts and intentions of the human heart during that time. So 6, 5 says, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of human heart was only evil at that time. Okay. So the thoughts and intentions were evil. He was like, it's so bad. I cannot even correct you. I'm going to have to let, let y'all go. Now we do see the Lord getting angry again, still in the old Testament. When we get closer to the reading about the Israelites, um, we do see him getting angry with them, but never to this degree where he's like, I'm just going to wipe the earth. Cause y'all stressing me out. Okay. And then it says in the study, Noah stood apart. He was different and his faithful obedience left a mark that will forever sit in the pages of scripture etched into God's story. We can presume the people mocked Noah as he built his giant boat, explaining that it was because a great flood was coming from the earth and the sky. It probably seemed even more ridiculous because some scholars believe it had never rained on earth before that day. It is so much easier to go with the flow, to not rock the boat, to fit in, to follow the crowd, but that's not God's way. God commanded us to not conform to the pattern of this world. He calls us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And we renew our minds through his living and active word. That's Romans 12 too. That is one of my favorite verses of all time in the Bible. For me as an entrepreneur, as a business coach, a life coach, like we are called to renew our minds every single day. All of us, not even if you don't fall into the category of a business owner, right? But there is so much power in reading his word and renewing your mind, like looking at what you think is possible and the limitations that living in this world has put on you. And then looking to God and saying, God, what do you have for me? God, what are you calling me to do in this season? And then just, just like Noah doing everything that God commands without questioning it, without doubting it, without, you know, having double mindedness, it causes you to literally renew your mind because you're having to unlearn all the things that people have told you and just assume and have faith that what God is telling you is what it is, right? It's the bottom line. And we know it's the bottom line. God has the final say. So Noah did not conform. He allowed his mind to be transformed through God's word. He heard, he listened, he believed, and he obeyed. What about us? What will we choose? But Noah was not perfect. Okay. Okay. And then it says, read Genesis 9, 21 through 25. What happened to show Noah was not perfect? No one is without sin, not even God's best leaders, patriarchs, kings, or prophets. First John 1, 8 says that. And no one does good all the time. That can be a proof of that can be found in Ecclesiastes 7, 20. Jesus stated that no one is good except God alone. That's in Mark 10, 18. God saw everything and knew everything about Noah, yet what Noah what yet, what did Noah find in the eyes of the Lord? Genesis 6, 8, right? So we assume that people mocked Noah. That's not actually written in the Bible, but I mean, you could just put it together, right? Like you can think about how would that be? Like even in this day and age, we just assume that that's what happened. But let's go read Genesis 9, 21 through 25. And I think this is good because I, I talk to a lot of women, like as a life and a mindset coach, business coach, like I pour into all the areas. I talk about health too, but 
as a life coach, I end up speaking with a lot of women um, who often feel like because they've made mistakes that they're not qualified to be leaders in what God is, in, in this season of what God has called them to do. You do not have to be perfect to be a leader. You do not have to be perfect to be called by God. Okay. So just let that stick in your brain. But in 9, 25, verse 9, 21 through 25, it says this. Let me pick this up. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk. Okay, so when I say he, we are talking about Noah and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. But Sham and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders when they walked in backward and covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned the other way so that they would not see their father naked. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves, he, will he be to his brothers. He also said, praise be to the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend Jepheth's te territory. May Jepheth live in the tents of Shem and may Canaan be the slave of Jepheth. So when I first read this, I was confused because like literally it tells us to read from verse 21, but 21 says when he drank some of its wine, he became drunk. Okay. So I'm going to go back and read 18 to give you guys some context. So verse 18 says, the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came to the people who were scattered over the whole earth. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk. Okay, so then we go into that same verse. I think what's important here is that we see Noah's not perfect. And when you read that at first glance, you're like, okay, he got drunk. Like, and when you're drunk, you do stupid things like lay in the bushes naked, <laughs> like in your twenties, that may be normal. Right. But overconsumption is not of God overconsumption of anything. Okay. So it's not that it was alcohol. Cause at this point in the Bible, there's nothing that says alcohol is bad at this point in the Bible. But, and I'm just saying that based off of the word, do not shoot the messenger. Okay. I'm just reading exactly what it says. But what we do know at this point is that overconsumption is something that God does not look upon favorably. Okay. So he overconsumed and he was indecent like this. He was not a good representation of God in that moment. And so for us, that just shows us like, oh my gosh, Noah, lay off the liquor. Like, you know, we see him being a real person. And in a lot of ways, it makes him kind of relatable. Like I've had a lot of times where I've overconsumed. I'm not gonna lie to y'all. In my twenties, I've had a lot of times where I've overconsumed alcohol all the way up until months ago. I have overconsumed food. I overconsumed Netflix. I overconsumed music. Like I have to check myself. And this is where the power of fasting comes into play really for us today. And this day and age is that fasting is a really great way to die to the flesh and reverse the habit of overconsuming because overconsuming becomes a habit. Like you don't even realize how much you're watching TV. You don't even realize how much you're listening to Megan Thee Stallion and Cardi B. Now, I'm not going to lie to y'all say I don't listen to that because I do, but I don't overconsume it. I don't listen to it more than I read the Bible. I don't listen to it more than I listen to gospel music. That's a no, right? So you have to kind of like check yourself sometimes and be like, wait a second. If I'm supposed to be focused and moving with intention so that I can live a life of abundance, because honestly, that's our ultimate goal, right? I want to go to heaven. I want to do the work of the Lord and I want to have an abundant life here on earth while I'm here. I would love for it to be nice and lush and have a nice house. And, you know, I would love to give to people. I want to make so much money that I have to give money away. And I'm a philanthropist. Like those are the types of, of life dreams that a lot of us have. And in order to do that, you have to be obedient and you have to be intentional. And so that means building positive habits that are going to get you to where you need to be. Overconsumption is a negative habit that has to be broken. What's the easiest way? And it, honestly, there is no easy way. It's not easy. But what is the easiest way to break a habit? Fasting from the habit. Like 
cold turkey, immediately removing the habit for a prolonged period of time, and then replacing that negative habit with a now positive habit that is intentional, that is tied to one of your biggest desires or biggest motivators. That's how you break old habits. You don't break old habits just by saying, I'm not going to do this anymore because guess what? That doesn't work. Like research shows us that doesn't work. I'm a life coach. I can tell you right now, it doesn't work. You have to break it fast, replace the habit. And that habit, that new habit has to be tied to a deep desire or deep motivation or else you won't stick with the new habit. And when you let the new habit go, the old habit will slip back in. Okay. So little, little rant about overconsumption, but that's what happened to Noah. Question three for today said the word favor in Genesis six, eight can also be translated to grace. Write your thoughts here about God's tremendous grace toward Noah and his family. How have you experienced this in your own life? So what I wrote is God gave Noah an amazing amount of favor for saving his entire family. God has also given me great favor by allowing me to grow my business and provide for my family in as many ways as I can. Nothing he has done for me is fair, but favor is not fair. Baby, what I tell you, nothing God has done for me is fair. It's not like being a six figure business owner at 25, not fair, not fair. Okay. Multi six figures before 30, not fair at all. So you have to think about, and that's, those are like major things. I've broken a lot of generational curses. I broke the generational curse of teen pregnancy in my family. I broke the generational curse of like just, just a whole bunch of stuff that I can't even list right now, but favor, baby favor is not fair. So when you start getting your Bible for real, you get under the covering and you get in the line where you get to receive favor and oh my gosh, the things that should have broken you, they won't break you. The grace that saved you, the time you should have got fired, you wouldn't got fired. The time you should have lost your car, you didn't lose your car. The time you should have died in that accident, you didn't die in that accident. Favor is not fair. Like, but you get the amazing blessing of experiencing grace and getting a pass. Like literally getting a pass in life on things that should have took you out, but didn't. And that is something to celebrate and rejoice about. I'm literally getting excited right now. (laughs) <laughs> favorite is not fair okay so that is all for today tomorrow tomorrow whenever the video for day four drops um we'll talk about the tower of babel and this is the introduction of curses in the bible which i think is so good because a lot of people see like the witchy stuff going on on social media and they're like curses curses are not real and uh, curses are real baby and i just said the word generational curse which a lot of people do recognize as real Um, But yeah, it's a lot of different types of curses that you see throughout the Bible. They are real. You do have to be weary of them. Okay, so that is all for today. I will see y'all for day four. Bye.